last time, we had the proper introduction of Bane. Now, this time we are covering, well, the start of a small group of side stories written before Bane's plan goes into full swing. This time, covering issues of Batman 484 and 485, written by Doug Mensch, art by Tom Gridberg, or Reinberg and Trevor Scott, colors by Adrian Roy, lettering by Richard Starkings, and edited by Scott Peterson and the legendary Danny O'Neill. We open on two guys in masks robbing a jewelry store and torching it after they're done, with one guy accidentally leaving their mask behind. Through narration, we learn the building is owned by Bruce Wayne, at the time of the fire, he was across town, as Batman. Bruce arrives on the scene of the fire and runs into Vicky Vale. They speculate as to the cause of the fire, it's clearly ar arson, but by who is the question. And Bruce flirts with Vicky, but she turns him down, as she's dating a co-worker, Horton Spence. Bruce is actually kind of broken up by this, and he starts actively wondering how long he can keep being Batman. Speaking of which, that night he returns to the jewelry store as Batman, and finds a mask in the ruins of the shop that doesn't belong. Meanwhile, at the Simonis family crypt, we learn the source of this mask. Roman Simonis, a.k.a. Black Mask. He has a new group of recruits in his False Face Society. Elsewhere, Robin makes his way to the Batcave, on foot, via Wayne Manor, commenting that he really wishes there was another way we in. Robin gets to the Batcave just in time for Bruce to take a call from Lucius Fox. Another building he owns was attacked, putting his insurance at risk for cancellation and causing tenants to threaten to move out, in turn jeopardizing the funding of the Wayne Foundation. Further, GCPD has been stretched thin due to budget cuts, which is also strengthening the mayoral bid for the tough-on-crime candidate, Armand Kroll. And worth mentioning here, both, both, both Bruce and Lucius Fox don't seem to view... Armand Kroll being a top on crime candidate is being a good thing, and it's his views aren't actually going to help Gotham particularly get better. It's interesting looking at this part of this story now, in the midst of calls for funding police depart or rather to say defunding police departments, and discussion of how police budgets fare in regard to public services. To use an example of a from the video that I put out when I took a my week of listening, where I encouraged you, my viewers, to but they'll check out voices of people of color on YouTube and Twitch streams and novels and comics and that sort of thing. And I got into this a little bit. Portland's Police Department has over $100 million more in their budget than the Portland Fire Bureau's budget and practically twice the budget of the Portland Parks Department, who handles homeless services in addition to maintaining city parks and that sort of and public services and that sort of thing. And that's still kind of even after a budget cut in the last range in the last set of budget meetings in the wake of protests in Portland. Now, by the time I've recorded this in June, there uh, there may still have been additional budget cuts made to the Portland Police Department, but the point still stands. Now, I think part of the thing with this story is that the writer and editors probably hadn't looked necessarily that critically at the budgets of police departments, even in the 90s, where you're starting to see budgets come up in the wake of the, or I'll say, after the start of the war on crime and the war on drugs. And combined with the idea of Gotham being a city where everything is, I mean, everything is notoriously underfunded anyway, where the rich and the elite don't necessarily pay their share in taxes. Leaving, leading to a situation where groups like the Wayne Foundation actively take up the slack, it makes sense to have these comments. Now, additionally, with how the GCPD has been depicted, it does feel like defunding or abolishing the GCPD would not necessarily affect the issues of institutional corruption within those organizations necessarily, has it been implied that corruption, part of that corruption is cops having to take bribes to make ends meet, in addition to additional standing issues of racism in society and how it's reflected in law enforcement, and also with stuff like um, people in police departments taking jobs because it lets them be a big man with power and boss people around and be violent and abusive. And before you say, oh, 
don't be bringing modern politics into this. This is an issue that has came up all the way back to Batman Year One, which I should mention was written by Frank freaking Miller, um, where the Gotham Police Department was corrupt and abusive and racist and utterly vile and with and with Gordon at that point who was Lieutenant Gordon being set up basically as the only as not just the well the world's most honest cop but in this case the only honest cop the Serpico a Serpico figure a figure who I, I specifically mentioned Serpico not just because that's who Miller was deliberately referencing but also because Serpico Frank Serpico is a person who is not still not remembered fondly in the New York City Police Department as well. So there, and that is something that's always kind of lingered, even once James Gordon has be, gone from Lieutenant Gordon to Commissioner Gordon, there's still kind of been that ongoing element in the lower levels of the GCPD. And I appreciate that in the Batman comics, particularly throughout Danny O'Neill's involvement as both writer and editor, that has been kept in mind. With, again, basically the writers taking the stance that Gordon James Gordon represents the ideal of what a good cop should be, and a good... Uh, and we will cut to this even more later on in the storyline. I'm not trying to jump things too far. With also acknowledging basically below him in the department plentiful examples of why the saying all cops are bastards has been a refrain of the po- of the protests against police brutality and institutional racism in law enforcement over the past what is now what is now at least yeah, as is recording about a, about 2 months and we'll probably the time this goes out we'll probably be hitting month 3 plus since these are still Batman books, the books manage to avoid the copaganda problem, for lack of a better term, that even Brooklyn Nine-Nine has had to face, and it's the reason why they've scrapped their final season and are doing a full rewrite, because Batman is keeping the GC... He keeps the GCPD at, at arm's length, or rather I should say the writers have it at arm's length, because the point-of-view characters, the characters we follow are not exclusively the cops. This isn't Goth- Greg Rucka and Gotham Central later. We, like, police officers are prospective characters in the story. Gordon and Bullock, who we're going to get to in a bit, Montoya, um, that sort of thing. But ultimately, it's a story about Batman, and it's a story about Robin and it's a story about Bruce Wayne, and I mentioned Batman and Bruce Wayne differently because the ways that they interact with society are different. Um, and because of those differences, it means that also Batman is able to directly confront law enforcement and call them on their bullshit in a way that either Gordon and other characters are hamstrung from doing because Gordon has his own institutional baggage that he has to contend with. Um, same thing with Elizabeth Tompkins. Um, she runs a social group and while certainly she well, while she's actively involved with trying to at a social services level make Gotham a better place and can speak up on problems in that regard she certainly can't get away with slamming a dirty cop against the wall and um or that sort of thing but it in short i guess what i'm trying to say is it does mean that the people who are writing and editing these these books at this time are like while what the story they're telling have prob- have problems this is not unproblematic by any stretch of the imagination it is also clear that the people who are writing them are aware of the problem and not trying to get around it. They're not, they are trying to address it in ways that they think work for them. The the ways they think work, they don't, they aren't always successful, but they are at least making the attempt. And that is something to be appreciated. I'm 
tap dancing around this a bit because we are going to get into this more in later issues. Part I will say this in particular when we get to the Arkham Breakout and the beginnings of Nightfall proper. And so I'm saving that for then. We're putting a pin in this, putting a bookmark in this conversation. It's not done. During Bruce's conversation with Lucius, he's been doing a chemical analysis of the mask and finds high-quality latex, but not paint. Tim checks the chemical companies to see what this is used for and if there are any uses for uh, uses for it by any interesting clients, and discovers it's normally used in Hollywood for movie masks. Right on cue, the bat signal is up. Batman, Robin, and Commissioner Gordon discuss this wave of arsons, and Batman and Gordon suspect that Black Mask is involved. The discussion is interrupted by Gordon's fiancée, Sarah Essen, coming to the roof. Sarah does not like, and certainly does not trust, Batman, partially because she thinks Batman views himself as above the law. Back in the Batmobile, Batman brings Robin up to speed on Roman's secret origin. Roman's family having ties to Bruce's, and the two even knowing each other as kids, before Roman's parents were tragically killed in a mysterious fire, which is mentioned with enough weight to it that I suspect that they may have been killed by their son. Roman then ran the company into the ground, with the final nail in the coffin being a cosmetic that contained an ingredient that can cause dramatic facial deformities in lower doses, and at higher doses could kill. Bruce bailed the company out, provided a new board of directors and who took over control of the company while still allow, still paying out a stipend to Roman. But still, at this loss of face, Roman snapped, killed the board, and then was nearly killed himself in his clash with Batman, but was saved, though his face was badly burned in the process. He was committed to Arkham until he broke out after Jeremiah Arkham took over in, if I recall, issues of Shadow of the Bat. We see some bits as part of this as of how Black Mask killed various members of the board using the toxic makeup, and yeah, I'm guessing why Black this is why Black Mask didn't show up in Batman the Animated Series. Roman's girlfriend slash Maul, Cersei, is also mentioned as well as a face model for the cosmetic company. But what's not mentioned is that the makeup also deformed her as well, ruining her modeling career. Speaking of which, Two of Black Mask goons find Cersei living in a homeless camp at a subway station and get her to come jo- get her to come back to Roman. Also, a blonde guy with a facial scar joins up with Sionis' gang. Sionis welcomes the guy personally, has him checked for a wire, and gives him a skull mask, dubbing him Skullface. His first job is to torch a Wayne building, and on the way there, the goons mention that the guards have been bribed to shut off the alarms. Once inside... Skullface goes to, to investigate his sound, namely Batman's costume being dropped off, while Robin takes on the other two goons as Skullface becomes Batman. The dynamic duo win handily, and Robin goes to war Lucius Fox, while Batman will return to Black Mask as Skullface. Unfortunately, Skullface makes it back just as Roman's number two comes in with a hostage that Roman wants, Lucius Fox. Issue 485 opens with Fox asking why he was chosen as a hostage. Well, because the Wayne Foundation caused Black Mask to lose face, which also makes Fox's blood perfect war paint. Okay. Bruce, as Skullface looks on, trying to find the best way to help Lucius, even if that means blowing his cover. Right before that moment comes, Cersei talks Black Mask down. As Bruce takes Lucius to the mask room, he lets him know that he's there on the down low. Meanwhile, Robin discusses Fox's abduction with Commissioner Gordon, letting him know that Batman has infiltrated um, Sionis' gang. At a meeting of Sionis' goons, a couple of members of the gang complain about the masks and are very quickly put down by Tattoo. Tattoo and Skullface report back to Sionis before Skullface is dismissed. In Skullface's absence, Tattoo and Sionis discuss Skullface, and Tattoo is suspicious of him, while Robin listens in with the transmitter that was built by Harold. I'll get to him later. Tim warns Bruce, but Bruce isn't ready to act yet. He has to get Gordon into position first. Later, Batman shows up at Gordon's office right as 
he and Sarah are in the middle of a disagreement over Batman. Batman, uh, Gordon is getting frustrated with the current state of their relationship, but now's not the time to resolve this. That night, Bruce comes to Sionis' base as Skullface, where Sionis is ready to torture Lucius after letting him starve for 24 hours. And he's going to start with the cosmetic compound. His hand force, Bruce blows his cover, saving Lucius but getting captured himself. However, before he is taken out, he is saved by Cersei, at which point Robin uses a smoke bomb to cover Bruce, Cersei, and Lucius' escape. Bruce sends Robin off with Lucius and Cersei to get the medical attention before heading back in as Batman to take on Tattoo and Black Mask, so they're kept clear of the GCPD, rounding up the rest of the gang at 10 p.m., which is some time away. As the GCPD wait for the appointed hour, Harvey Bullock flutes, flirts with Renee Montoya and is rebuffed. Getting back to current events for a second, it is important to say Harvey Bullock, as a character, has aged the worst of most of the occurring members of the GCPD who work with Gordon. They've tried to address this to varying degrees for why he's still around, why he acts the way he does, and attempts have been made to address the how he how and why he acts the way he does. But it's still a point that has aged the worst of these particular well, not the worst, but one of the points that have aged particularly bad of these stories. There's another bit later that we will get into. Again, we're going to put a pin in this, but this is a point where these stories have aged poorly. I would still like, again, particularly in the wake of current events that are going on regarding protests, the Batman writing room, the Batman writing staff, and the editors, and that sort of thing, to get into this, to get into the weeds with the GC, with the Gotham Police Department, in particular with the problems of Harvey Bullock as a character. But... Um, like I could come up with head cannons or ex or explanations or that sort of thing, but ultimately, this is something that should be addressed and needs to be addressed. And I hope that DC, the the writers of the Bat books, acknowledge the moment, acknowledge the current situation, and that this needs to be talked about. Back in Simonis's base. Um, Batman uses the smoke to disarm Simonis, and he and Tattoo flee, but the clock has now struck ten, triggering the raid before they're able to show up. So, their gang is getting rounded up as well. Instead, uh, Black Mask and Tattoo flee to the docks to take a boat, but Batman catches up with them. The Bat takes down Tattoo fairly ha handily, and Black Mask falls into the river, and Batman isn't able to find him. Later, Batman and Gordon discuss the night's work, and Gordon reveals they couldn't find Simonis. There was a body wearing a mask like his, but on the face of a missing Wayne Corp executive who was in those throwaway panel earlier in the storyline. Uh, Howard Rambo. So, this is a good, short little story on its own. Um, it is interesting, again, like revisiting this after my initial blog posts in the wake of everything that's happened since then. As far as it fit, how it fits into the Nightfall saga, this is a case where it's included in the prologue because of its impact in the aggregate, where several f stories that we are going to get to over the next few episodes are going to build off of this as we lead into the actual beginnings of Nightfall proper. So, on its own, it's all right. It doesn't do too, like, it is laying a cup, like, some very basic groundwork. Like, survey, we're not at the cornerstone of the event. We're not, we are at the, uh, we've surveyed out the place you're building, the building levels of the event. But it's, like, I can, no. Vengeance of Bane number one is the cornerstone. This is setting up perimeter, basically. Um, not figuring out perimeter. We're not quite at the, there's a second cornerstone coming up, but we're not at it yet. Now, before we go for this issue, and I make my little quippy remarks about what the next issue's storyline is going to be, or the next episode, I should say, is going to be, we do need to say goodbye to someone in real life who has passed away in between our my last installment of the series. In June... We lost Denny O'Neill, the legendary Denny O'Neill, 
O'Neill was, in addition to being the editor of the Batman comics throughout the Nightfall storyline, he was a longtime writer of Batman comics as well. His run on Batman the 1970s retooled a character in a way that allowed for the more grounded take that we got after Crisis on Infinite Earths. Batman Year One would not exist without Denny O'Neill's run on Batman. O'Neill also introduced the character of Ra's al Ghul, who, and some of the storylines involving Ra's, um, like were straight up like used, like the dialogue whole cloth in Batman the Animated Series. For that matter, um, Leslie Tompkins is introduced uh, by Denny O'Neill as well as part of his the effort to make Batman a more grounded character, as someone who is contending with stuff other than cartoonish supervillain plots. It also, he also brought the Wayne Foundation a little more to the forefront in the idea that Batman isn't just trying to make Gotham City better by punching supervillains in the face. Batman is a character who was... Batman is part of the fix. Bruce Wayne works to make Gotham better by using the, his money and resources in the Wayne Foundation to work in, as improve, to improve the city as a whole, both through providing public service, to helping to fund public services that the city probably should be providing, but is not able to do so for a variety of reasons. And as Batman working to basically push back against those in positions of wealth and power and authority who are preying upon the city and using their positions of privilege to escape from basically the repercussions of their actions. As If you get to get back to Batman Year One for a second, which again is not a Denny O'Neill story, but one which borrows a great deal from him and where Frank Miller has directly cited Denny O'Neill as being the reason that that book exists at all, is there's the famous dinner table speech in that one where Batman interrupts the council of wealthy businessmen and gangsters. Um, basically come in and say, right, this is it. You're done. I am stopped. You have fed on this, preyed on the city for too long. I'm stopping you now. And that's... And in Denny O'Neill's run on Batman, like... That is how, like, that is how the rich idiot with no day job, Bruce Wayne, fit into the Batman side of things. There were more than a few stories that Denny O'Neill wrote, which was Batman, which is Bruce Wayne, through the social circles he moves in, picks up information from Gotham's wealthy and elite about basically, oh, this rich guy is also doing gun running. And then Batman comes in, shuts down the gun runners, and sends the rich guy who's running the operation to jail. Um, that sort of thing. Batman takes the... Basically, Bruce Wayne figure, finds out who's putting the guns on the streets, and then Batman get make, and then Batman makes sure that they can't put the gun that they can't put the guns on the streets anymore. That sort of thing. Um. And beyond that, um, when Denny O'Neill basically did the, took over writing Green Lantern with and started the Green Lantern, Green Arrow, Hard Traveling Heroes era, that brought this even more to the forefront, where it's basically Oliver Queen getting Hal Jordan, you no, know, you have lost perspective, you have lost your grounding with the realities of what it of what life is like with your flying around with your power ring and dealing with aliens with, with space aliens and that sort of thing you need to travel around at ground level for the while for a while and see what's really going on and I'm going with you and it's him and it's a it's Green Lant it's Green Lantern, Green Arrow, and Black Canary, uh, Dina Lance, uh, was again quickly known as the hard traveling heroes era of those characters. And like that storyline had made a marked change in basically all three characters. Or in, in particular, like 
there are a lot of people who didn't like, like, who weren't fans of Green Arrow, Green Lantern before, but who were turned into Green Lantern fans by Dan- by Daniel's era with that character. And then Danny would do it again with the question, where he his revisited version of the character of Vic Sage was in very many ways a rebuttal of. Alan Moore's reinterpretation of the character as Rorschach in um, in Watchmen, in some cases very directly, and ref- and so, in short, Denny O'Neill is probably one of the best comics writers we've had overall. He is a legend of comics. I when I say the legendary Denny O'Neill. I'm not just saying that to be pithy. I'm not just saying that to be quippy. It is because I deeply respect Denny O'Neill as a writer. And he's a person who, um, if this had gone long and long enough and the show had reached a point where I felt like, okay, I sh- I'm going to try to reach out for interviews with some of the people who worked on this who are still around, Denny O'Neill would be the top of the list of the people who I wanted to interview for the show. Um, as far as the hard traveling heroes era goes, the last story that I'm aware of that Denny O'Neill has ever written was for the uh, Green Lantern 80th anniversary issue with Denny O'Neill and Mike Krell, Mike Grell, who wrote the Long Green Arrow, the Longbow Hunters, basically going together to tell a story revisiting both Lant, Hal, and Ollie one more time. Um, so, I guess what I say is this. There have been comments that have been made that politics doesn't fit in comics, that politics aren't, don't belong in comics, comic, that the people who have faded objections to comics trying to be socially conscious or socially literate, to com- that comic, objecting to comics commenting on modern society. And to, as a rebuttal of that, I, all I need to say is Denny O'Neill. Denny O'Neill's run on on Green Lantern uh, and um, Green Arrow, his run on the Question, his run on Batman, and how his work has spilled out to other to his contemporaries for how it impacted the, the Robin stories that were being Robin and Batgirl stories that were being written in uh, the backup features on Batman and Detective Comics um, show that. That comics should comment on society and what's going on. That comic books should reflect the world we live in now, as well as the world that we want to live in, and the route that we want to take to get there. That you can have the superhero story where you can have superheroes punch out supervillains and in the process get into have the actions of the supervillains be reflective of the problems of society that need to be addressed and in turn what really needs to be done to address them that punching a villain doesn't isn't the thing that fixes the problem that there's more to it than that that the most visible cause of the issue is not the underlying cause necessarily, nor and removing antagonists like doesn't address the root cause of the antagonism. You punching and and that and getting more into that and uh, in addition to having to taking advantage of the medium to have well and this is something that basically taking a cue from things that Marvel was doing as well, of that Marvel having villains who were representative of the problems in society. And that sort of thing, and that sort of thing as well, where you had the hate monger that um, Steve Englehart had um, Captain America fight, that sort of thing. And basically going that, and 
with Denny O'Neill and other art- authors going. Okay, that, that's a good start, but the next step is these villains, you, you punch out the hate monger, the clan doesn't go away. The punch out the hate monger, racism doesn't go away. You have to take the next step. And, in, and having characters who recognize that and also would try to address that in their own way. Or to empower superpowered beings who empower us to take the next step to make situations better and to build a better world. So, with that in mind, once again, I'd like to say thank you very much to Denny O'Neill for all that you have done. Comics and Godspeed. And on that note, next time we have two one shot stories with characters with some of the worst character designs I have ever seen. So there's that to look forward to. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.